to welcome you back to Be More News Part 2 uh, with Boyd Rutherford here at the Rutherford and, and uh, Hogan campaign headquarters. Mental health. Mental health is an issue. Um, we were talking about it at the trafficking conference last night in downtown Baltimore. A any thoughts on the violence and the mental health well, that prompts the violence? Yeah, there, there's a challenge there. Um, and part of the problem is awareness. There's been a stigma attached for, for many years, many decades, there's been a stigma attached to uh, mental health issues. Um, I visited a, a mental health provider, uh, assistance provider, just this week in Montgomery County called Cornerstone Montgomery. And they pointed out that one in five people will be affected by mental health issues, either directly or through a family member. Now, this isn't any one ethnic group, one no, demographic, it's across, across the board, board America. Across the board, America. One in five of us will ultimately have some type of challenge in, in right. the realm of mental health, mental illness. And it, it wouldn't be a stretch, and I don't have the data to support it, but it wouldn't be a stretch to say that people in the lower economic strata are going to be in a position where they're less likely to get help and less likely to get assistance because they don't they may not have the support structure that's going to try to get them help but it's very difficult to get help for a, an adult you know be it your child or a spouse or a family member of some sort and when we talk to different people around the state law enforcement judges they talk about mental health being an issue that they have to deal with, and it shouldn't be a law enforcement issue. Is your competitor, and this is a loaded question asking mm. you, but do you hear your competitor discussing mental health? We mental have illness? not heard him say it in any public forum or any um, initiative. We know that while he's been lieutenant governor, uh, the, the governor's budget has cut money for mental health and the, the mental health assistance. In a mental, democratic state. In a democratic state. Yeah, that he's cut that, that uh, support that some of these agencies, particularly the nonprofits, could utilize to assist the community and those folks who have these difficulties and these challenges. So uh, how does that play in when you look at uh, the, the criminality and, and, and the, uh, the prison population? I would think if well, they're not getting mental health help, they're getting locked up. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, often what happens, and it can be domestic violence. I was talking to a judge in Howard County. She mentioned to me, she said, a lot of the domestic violence that comes across cases that come before her on the bench, there's a mental health aspect to it, where either it's the spouse has a problem and he's beating his spouse or, or vice versa, or it's a family member that is uh, brutalizing their, their parents because they have mental health issues. And what happens, they, they're brought in through the criminal justice system. As opposed in, through the mental health. Through mental health or health care environment. Where they can get now, some help. Where they can get some help. Now we are gonna look to see what we can do to help in that process in terms of providing the resources that can be utilized by these organizations. Another thing that was mentioned in the meeting yesterday where they saw a gap in the system, because I, I, I was there to learn. Um, and what was this meeting again? With a, a group called Cornerstone Montgomery. Okay. They are a provider, a nonprofit provider of services to predominantly um, indigent through, through Medicaid, um, people who have mental health issues. And they also have residents where you know people can stay there if they need that, that type of So assistance. they certainly have their pulse on the uh, flow of the mental health state exactly. in Maryland. The state, and they were talking about the funding and how it's been cut. Uh, the difficulties that they have, the challenges in terms of, you know, when people have, you know, addressed their mental health issues, what happens going forward? You know, a similar area, and it's not too, too far off, the whole question of collateral consequences, and we've talked about, you know, getting jobs for people who've been incarcerated and coming back out in the barriers, they face some of the same barriers, because many of these people who had mental health issues, they may have gotten caught up in the criminal justice system. And so once the mental health issue has been addressed and they are at steady state, they have difficulty getting jobs because of a criminal history that was really due to a mental incapacity versus an intentional act. So if they never got the, the mental health, uh, well, if they can get the mental health treatment, then they can 
you know, prayerfully productive, productive citizens. But then they run into that same problem that some of our ex-offenders they run have a into, record that they have that record, and there are certain le regulations which I've told you before. We're going to try to address as many of those as possible regulations and statutes that prevent them from getting some of these jobs, and some of them are entry-level jobs. That they can't get. You know, I got to deviate. You, you, I tried to stay on on <laughs> on point, but as you were talking, I remember when the whole concept of the ban the box was, was was heavy in Baltimore, and it was a the the Greater Baltimore Committee that felt like it would hurt the business community to help people who have a record get a job. Mm -hmm. That it would not attract other you know businesses from out of state to come here. Is that true? I don't, you know, I don't know how true that is, but I do think unless you address that whole issue of collateral consequences, you can have ban the box. Someone can go through the interview process and they can decide, hey, I do want to hire you to be a driver at this assisted living facility. But then they find out that there's a regulation that says if you've had a drug offense, or you've had a misdemeanor or felony, you can't work in an assisted living. And facility. you know that ultimately disaffects black men more than anybody else. Oh, absolutely, and, and particularly when we're looking at Baltimore, but we look at just generally across the country, the, the jail and prison population. We have more that come from the black community than our representation in the overall population. Well, you hold that thought. We're coming right back. Keep watching. BeMoreNews.com.